Hi everyone, I'm excited to share with you this uh, conversation I had with Justin Ariel Bailey. In case you're not familiar with him, just a short introduction to his work. He is uh, Associate Professor of Theology at Dort University. And his wheelhouse, his specialty is really the intersection of theology and culture. And um, he only has two books out, um, but I've really appreciated both of them. They are Remaining Apologet or Reimagining Apologetics was his first book, and then his more recent book was called Interpreting Your World. Our conversation largely uh, is focused around this, this one in particular because it just came out. Um, but Justin is an extremely kind and thoughtful person, um, and we, in our conversation, we talk, like I said, a lot about this book in which he proposes five lenses for kind of analyzing or interpreting culture. Um, we talk quite a bit about the idea of uh, culture as meaning and how culture can function as an ecosystem. Uh, we talk a lot about the power dynamics in culture and especially the work of critical theory and how to have a uh, thoughtful engagement with critical theorists. We talk about beauty in culture and we even talk a bit at the end about our shared love of Tolkien, which was a fun thing to discover. So I really enjoyed this interaction with Justin and uh, I think that you, if you've followed my channel for some time, uh, I think that you will really appreciate his posture and his thoughtfulness as well. So I commend to you, Justin Ariel Bailey. Welcome to Books and Big Ideas, What I'm Reading, What I'm Thinking About, with Joel Wentz. Awesome. So uh, I'm here with Justin Ariel Bailey, and we're talking, well, we might, our conversation might range a bit, but we're talking about his new book, Interpreting Your World, which I loved. I uh, loved both of his books, actually. And um, I would love to theme our conversation as much around this book as possible, um, because it's new. And I think, I, I do think, you know, um, my humble little niche of audience on YouTube, I think is going to really appreciate your work. So um, I'd love to start just by kind of talking big picture about kind of what you're trying to do with the book. Uh, I see, I see it as an attempt to kind of thicken, particularly towards Christians, maybe of the evangelical or, you know, whatever that word means these days, like, you know, quasi evangelical background, trying to thicken our um, engagement with culture or our posture of engagement with culture. So, um, that's kind of what I see you doing, but I'd love you to just unpack what you're trying to do, if that's a good way to describe it, um, kind of what's your overarching goal with the work. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thanks for reading my books and uh, interacting yeah. with them. Uh, well, first, let me speak to the question of evangelical or quasi-evangelical. I mean, this is sort of the discussion of the moment, right? Yeah. Who is mm -hmm. an evangelical? Do we retain the label? Is it Does it mean anything anymore? And I have been really helped in thinking through it a friend of mine, Dan Stringer, wrote a book called Struggling with Evangelicalism, in which he said evangelicalism is not just a brand, it's also a space. Mm -hmm. um, and I have found that really helpful in terms of, um, well, there's lots of us that might want to depart from the brand, whatever the brand is, or if we feel like the brand has changed, but a lot of us still inhabit evangelical spaces. And, yeah. um, and so wherever we find ourselves, uh, if those spaces are characterized by, you know, the features of evangelicalism, uh, our responsibility is to leave it better than we found it. Mm. Um, and so that's one of the things that I sort of see myself trying to do. I do come from and inhabit evangelical spaces, including a, uh, a un Christian university uh, where I teach and Christian churches where I preach and things like that. Um, most of the people who read my books are sort of of that in those spaces as well. And so I think thinking of spaces or culture as an ecosystem um, and this mm. polluted ecosystem that we have to care for uh, is incredibly more helpful than some other metaphors that have been used to describe culture, namely a battlefield um, in right. which we are constantly waging a war, waging a war and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and battled and, you mm -hmm. know, um, feeling a tremendous anxiety to win or to lose uh, in every single moment you know yeah so in a very real sense what i'm trying to do is to follow people like makoto fujimura in shifting from a metaphor of culture war to metaphor of culture care um, mm. i think that helps in so many ways first of all because i think it's more robustly biblical um, where humans as caretakers of creation is the primary uh, metaphor i think that we are meant to have in which any sort of battling or resisting uh, thorns and thistles has to be framed within the larger metaphor of culture care. Um, I think it is uh, just also from a purely almost pragmatic um, 
uh, sense, just it's not sustainable and it's exhausting. And there's all sorts of um, damage that I think happens to people who engage in culture war. Um, mm. And so I think that what I've tried to do here is to provide an alternative way of thinking about cultural engagement that, yeah, it sort of teases out in some concrete ways uh, what would it look like to engage culture if culture care and not culture war is our dominant metaphor? In the same way that in That's reimagining good. apologetics, I sought to say, how would we do apologetics differently if culture care and not culture war is our dominant metaphor? That's good. It makes me think of, um, I hadn't thought of this until you just made those comments, but it makes me think of some of the language around government or policy initiatives like like a war on poverty um, mm. or war on terror, you know, like if you stop and think for a second, it's like, is there any way that this will ever end, <laughs> you know, uh, mm. and ceaseless war? And what more, what I'm thinking is what does that do to the psyche? You know, like the anxiety oh. you're talking about the us for, of course, us versus them dynamics. Um, I've heard people in Christian or evangelical circles use the language of feeling like we're under siege, which is another yep. warfare analogy or you know uh that that stuff i don't know yeah that stuff shapes the way that you uh that's right the way that you live and move and have your being you know if that if the space you're in is constant um under under constant threat uh that can't be uh can't be healthy it's certainly not what we see in the life of christ either so anyways it just yeah, makes me think sure. about how these things shape us but does that yeah. cause any reaction to you yeah that's why i think that we have to think really hard about metaphors metaphors shape our imagination yeah. um and set the rules of engagement in so many different ways. Uh, you know, I was teaching a, an ethics class this semester and it occurred to me as, I, as we were reading Machiavelli and, you know, talking about just war theory, you know, versus pacifism versus some, something like just peacemaking um, and just the really high standard that there is even for just war theory in terms of what sort of wars are just. And it occurred to me that, you know, if we think about culture war under the <laughs> conditions of those various, um, theories of actual war, um, how often our sense of culture war is not also waged in accordance even with just war theory, you know? Wow. Um, and we have these, this almost Machiavellian uh, perspective on what we can or can't do because it's war, you know? And wow. in war, you just try to win. Yeah. Uh, whereas even within Christian faith, there is a very robust tradition of what constitutes just war. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's all sorts of assumptions that kind of get packed into that metaphor that if it becomes your operative metaphor, yeah, then you have, it, it's traumatizing in, in some ways. Yeah. Um, um, I don't want to, again, for the sake of a metaphor, diminish actual war and, and what right. the damage done to people who actually um, fight in wars. But I think that there is some, there's a connection that can be made there in terms of um, the exhaustion um, and the anxiety. Yes. Yep. And um, that is felt by people that always feel themselves in the midst of culture war. Oh, absolutely. No, that, that resonates a lot with me. Um, wow. I kind of just want to talk about this for the next 45 minutes, but we'll, I'll resist. <laughs> I'll resist. I want to talk about your lenses because I think they're so helpful, yeah. but actually it does set up, it does set up what you're doing in the book really well because your lenses the five lenses you put forward. First of all, none of them are violent. <laughs> there's no, there's no violence in, implied in, in any of this interaction you're kind of posing with culture. And, you know, you are, I kind of see them as different layers. Maybe you could see different spheres. I don't know, lots of different length That's metaphors right. you could use. Um, but like I said, I see you thickening kind of the ways that we try to even conceptualize how do we engage with this, this really amorphous thing we we all kind of think we know what culture is until you yeah. start trying to di define it, you know, and talk about it intelligently. Um, so yeah, how do we engage with that? Well, um, in lots of these different ways. So you post five, uh, I'm sure different models could pose different numbers or, you know, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But of the five you pose, uh, I want to, I don't think we'll have time to talk about all five, but um, I do want to at least hit a few. And I'd love to start with the first one because I, I think the first one you pose is meaning for those who have not read the book. Um, I would just love to hear you talk about what that means, what that looks like, um, because I found this one to be potentially the most potentially the most important one, but also maybe the hardest one to wrap your mind around. So I would just love to hear you tease it out and kind of talk. Yeah, about meaning is there. again one of those things like you just said with yeah. culture. Um, 
as soon as you start to say, well, what do we mean yeah. by meaning, you know? <laughs> and so that's yeah. what I was trying to get my hand, my handle on in this, because in some ways it's the most intuitive and in some ways it's the most opaque. Mm -hmm. So it's intuitive because um, we all have had the experience of walking through the world and being attracted to particular things because they, they resonate with us or, you know, so surfing social media or, or, the internet and being attracted to certain things that just resonate or feeling really strong resistance, mm. um, sort of emotional resistance to, to certain things. And so that's why I, I kind of use this metaphor of an immune system. Uh, what the immune system is, is a dynamic system of discernment, which is evaluating our surroundings and making sure that um, we only take in that which is good for us. Mm. Um, and a cultural immune system. So our sense are, if we think of meaning at creating a sort of cultural immune system means that as I go through the world, there are going to be some things that just absolutely connect with me immediately. And some things that I feel this kind of almost visceral resistance against. And, um, and I, I wanted to frame it that way, because I think it, it captured this sense of the virality of culture. Why do things go viral? Uh, well, in some sense, they go viral because it, they found a key that seems to unlock lots of lots of doors for lots yeah. of people um, and virality captures the sense that meaning happens to us um, we make meaning yes but meaning also happens to us yeah and um, and so that's what I was trying to kind of get at with this uh, with this sense of meaning I was trained to see culture to, to interact with culture as a text uh, from my professor, Kevin Van Hooser, who wrote the foreword. And I love, you know, I love his work and he's been so helpful to me. Um, but one of the reasons I wrote this book with five lenses is because I felt like treating culture as a text almost separated us from it uh, yes. too much as if it's this inert thing that's that I can sort of hold up and examine from all these different angles. And I started with meaning because I wanted to say that, um, you know, it, it, it has its hooks in us before yeah. we begin to examine us. We are always in danger of kind of catching it, you know, that we are, it's contagious. Um, and that was the sense that I was trying to get it with, with culture as a, a dynamic system of meaning That's good. Um, in which certain viral strains of culture kind of come into our immune system. And then we also resist other things. And so mm. uh, when we engage culture, the first question is sort of, why do I resonate with this? Why do I resist it? that sort of discernment has to begin with what it's doing to me and, and how it strikes me and yeah. whether or not it finds a home in me, making me feel more secure in the world or making me feel less secure in the world. And that's what I'm trying to do with uh, the meaning dimension of culture. I'm not sure if that is, if no, it that's great, it up, but that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. No, it's super helpful actually. And even some things are clicking into place, even as you're talking for me. And one thought I had as you're describing that, well, two thoughts. One thought is, um, immune systems can be faulty. You know, That's I don't want right. to push, I don't want to push the analogy to they all, every analogy breaks if you, you know, lean on it too hard, but there is something here for me, at least the, the spaces I grew up in evangelical spaces broadly, you know, um, there can be a way in which we were learning now that, for example, I think there's a lot of studies that have shown that keeping kids completely away from peanuts and tree nuts can actually increase the presence of more, um, violent allergic reactions you know in in populations so like there's a sense in which i guess what i'm trying to get at is like some impulses in certain certain conservative fundamentalist evangelical places can take that approach as to like don't don't touch look or even go near um certain aspects of culture uh out of an intent to protect, but what can happen, what I, I'm sure you've seen happen too, is that people who haven't been interacted with those things at all, they hit 18, they go off to college, and then they don't even know how. They have no immune system that's built up to discern, to interrogate, to question right. in any healthy way. Um, and so I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that can have very, very deleterious effects um, on development. Um, so that's one thing that popped into my mind. Um, I, I don't know if, you, if, if that resonates with you or where you're going with yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. We can become immunocompromised uh, in the cultural discernment sense as well. Yeah. Um, both in terms of our immune system failing to recognize actual threats as well as our immune system being unprepared to deal with real threats. Um, yeah, that's good. To us. And, and I think that that's, um, yeah, part of why we, 
I always just try to make the point that it's it's very difficult to be completely extracted from culture. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have to be intentional about the way that we are engaged with culture. Mm -hmm. um, because if we simply try to retreat and withdraw from it, then we don't realize all the ways that it, yeah, the back door is open in some sense. Absolutely. Uh, and and I, I also don't want to say, I want to be mindful of, I, I don't want to say as though that only manifests in the conservative fundamentalist spaces that, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, because I, I see it. I live in a very, very progressive area of the country in New England. And, um, and I see the same impulses in a lot of people who are in very, very, very different, uh, you know, cultures or, or religious or non-religious spaces than what I grew up in. So that just that, that impulse is, it's not unique to any one cultural that's right. kind of place. Yeah, that's right. Just want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, but that's the one that I grew up with and, and can resonate with. The other thought I had, and this will maybe set us up for the next lens in an interesting way, but um, the other thought that occurs to me while you're talking is that there is an, an intrinsic, th this is another difference between looking at culture as a text. I think there can be an intrinsic individualistic way of mm -hmm. thinking or assuming we interact with a text on an individual level. What does it mean to me? How do I read it? But what you're posing is an immune system has to be communal. You know, like if I'm, if, if meaning can catch me and move between people, there's a undeniable communal element to that. And, you know, we're yeah. living in the shadow of a tragic uh, global experience of realizing <laughs> these things are not individual and immune systems and viruses are not in individual experience. So that's the other thing that, that occurs to me. That seems really important. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that there's lots of different thinkers we could learn for, from on this, you know, Jonathan Haidt, you know, his account yeah. of uh, moral intuitions and the way that um, we use the, our rational minds to justify our intrinsic kind of intuitive responses to things, you know, um, the reason acts more like a defense attorney yeah. to defend whatever our position is than it does as sort of a neutral judge evaluating the evidence equally. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, you have, yeah, the, this struggle that we have right now of people perceiving the world in such different ways mm -hmm. is because that's the way that we're sort of wired is mm -hmm. first of all, to resolve, to resolve the discomfort um, of the, of the sense that we are under threat in our, in our cultural immune systems, especially yeah. as you come that's into good. contact with rival immune systems, you know, where the things that give you meaning that anchor you are the things that feel threatening to somebody mm. else. Um, and then that's where you have the potential of a violent collision wow. um, between the two. Wow. That's good. It's really helpful. Um, I would love to talk about the second lens is power. Uh, I mentioned to you in, I think in my email that this, this might've been my favorite chapter. I'm not sure, you know, not that I have to <laughs> pick a favorite, but uh, it might've been my favorite in particular because of your, really thoughtful engagement with critical theory, which speaking of, you know, things that people feel very under threat, yeah. people very threatened by critical theory is kind of a boogeyman for a lot of people right now. Um, or on the other side, it's this unassailable, you know, uh, thing that can't be questioned on, you know, for, for some too. Right. Um, but I would love to talk about the lens of power. Um, I would love to just particularly think about interacting with something like critical theory, how do we do that with a more generous spirit and thoughtful spirit as you, as you model in the book so well? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for saying that about that chapter. It was the hardest one to write and oh, the wow. one that I'm least satisfied with, um, mm. in part because of how hard it is to live in that tension that yep. you just articulated. Um, on the one side, you have, um, in my at least in my estimation, you have people who only see power. Uh, yeah. Power dynamics is the only variable that gets that gets an analyzed uh, power imbalance and exposing it and you know doing something about it. And then on the other hand, you have people who can't seem to even see power dynamics or at least deny or ignore or pretend as if they don't exist. And so it's very difficult to live in the tension between those two. And so part of, um, yeah, well, part of writing this book is, is an attempt to um, complicate things, I guess, for both sides. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to deal with power as early as possible uh, because power uh, indeed shapes who lives and who dies um, mm. in, in a very real sense. 
Uh, and yet I wanted to say, if the power lens is the only lens we use, we have missed a really, we have missed the complexity of culture. Yeah. Uh, power is not the only variable uh, that will allow us to understand what's going on. And if, um, yeah, if we only have that as a hammer, then yep. all we'll know how to do is to smash things, you know? So I think that's what I was trying to do in that chapter is to um, say, this is really important um, to be able to see how culture is not just about meaning, it's also about power. And the struggle to say, who is at the center? Whose perspective gets to be normative? Who, you know, who fits and who doesn't? You know, that is a, a very real feature of culture always. Um, and then at the same time to say, but, there's so much more to culture than power. Yeah. Um, so uh, as far as critical theory goes, I think I wanted to say critical theory is this long dis this discursive tradition of doing exactly that, um, trying to do <laughs> yeah. power analysis um, and uh, detect power imbalance, power failure, so to speak. And uh, we need to take it seriously. Uh, power critical theory in the way it's talked about in contemporary discourse is sort of an empty cipher that means yeah. almost anything. That's so true. And so uh, I, I, I wanted to say in the words of, um, of a mentor, Rich Mao, you know, he said uh, to me once, you know, Karl Marx is not our judge. Um, Jesus is our judge, but we should let Karl Marx take the witness stand. <sighs> oh, that's and good. I found, I found that such a helpful perspective when it comes to uh, critical theory or when it comes to um, deconverted, you know, atheists or mm -hmm. you know, people who are very critical of, of my faith, uh, very critical of Christianity. I think that um, uh, I found it really helpful to um, to think in terms of giving testimony um, and mm. uh, allowing others to testify against us. Mm -hmm. And they're not our judge, but if we are secure because of the love of God for us in Christ, then we should allow anyone to take the witness stand um, yeah. against us and, and know that um, they can call us into question. And so that's what I'm trying to let critical theory do in the power chapter is to say, yes, they let's let them take the witness stand. And so I talk a bit about Marx, uh, a bit about Gramsci, um, a bit of the Frankfurt School, um, mm -hmm. especially in the way that they talk about culture as distraction you know, right. um, and diversion from the work of justice. And then I want to come through that. And I also want to listen to, especially our brothers and sisters um, in Christ who um, are saying, we're not getting this from critical theory. We're getting this from the Bible. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and the prophets have a lot to say about these sorts of things. And so um, I think it's really important to hear that testimony as well. Yeah. Um, and so where I sort of end up is, it's saying that there is both an aspect of naming the world and there is an aspect of negating idolatry, which really is what I think critical theory is trying to do. Um, the iconoclastic kind of iconoclasm. Yeah. 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 Taking things off their pedestals, yeah. so to speak. And yeah. I say that there's another kind of iconoclasm besides cancellation where you kind of tear things down from the pedestal and it's complication, which is yeah. really what I'm trying to do in the book is an iconoclasm yeah. of complication. And just to say, um, let's let it loosen its hold on our imagination by emplacing it among other other narratives or other stories or other lenses. That's good. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do in the power chapter, uh, how successfully I did it. I'm not sure. I, I go back and read it and I'm like, oh, I wish I would have said that in a different way, or I wish mm. that I'd been stronger, or I wish sometimes I had been, um, I don't know, maybe not stronger. Maybe I wish I had been, I'd, I don't know. I just wish I'd said it a different way. So it's the, it's the thing that I've written that I always feel conflicted about. So hmm. it's encouraging to me to hear you say that it helped. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I loved it. Um, it was one of my big takeaways from the book. I'm it's probably the chapter I'll revisit the, the soonest. Um, because I try to do a lot of engagement with critical theory as well. Um, just as something of interest to me. Um, so I appreciate your work and your labor in that, in that area. Um, I would love to know, I mean, I got a sense of just from some of who you, you cited, but, um, are there any theorists you've found particularly helpful or even, I don't know if edifying would be the right word or just some, who, who are some that have been helpful in your own journey with the subject of power and iconoclasm and all of that? Are you, are you talking about secular theorists or Christian, Christian things? I, I had um, secular in mind, but I guess either. Um, yeah, either. Whoever comes to mind for you. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that I've benefited quite a bit from some of the thinkers in the Frankfurt School um, sure. and the way that they talk about pop culture. And I'm teaching a class on pop culture right now. And so I found, you know, a lot of the things that they've said about pop culture quite helpful as a lens for analysis, um, just to hopefully help students see. And I always tend to err more on the meaning side. And I'm always wanting to, get, you know, what, what does this mean? Like, what yeah. are they trying to communicate? But it, it, it does make me worry a bit that, you know, a single company is telling all the stories, you know, is kind of sure. controlling all the stories for our, our culture. And critical theory has helped me kind of have some tools for understanding the way that mm -hmm. um, the continual content mill um, that's yeah. put out by these culture industries um, does something to us and does something to um, our ability to uh, meaningfully um, react to injustice. Um, yeah. You know, it's, I, again, I don't want to oversell that because I think that we have agency and that there's all sorts of ways that we take things that might be deformative uh, and turn them, you know, in, in positive ways. But that, mm. that's been really helpful to me. Um, things well, especially by Horkheimer and Adorno, things, yeah. things, things on culture industries. Um, yes. I think I found those quite, quite helpful. That's where my mind was just going was some of the work on, uh, and I'm far from an expert, but, um, but Same. some of yeah. the work on the culture industry and entertainment and yeah. particularly the concern from a lot of critical theorists as they look at the West broadly, the concern they seem to have about how entertainment can be, well, you use the word distraction, but like how it can, well, yeah, distract us, turn, turn our attention from what matters, uh, turn our attention from, or even make us complicit in potentially serious injustice, you know, um, I think that's a, uh, that's a, that's a, there's a prophetic voice, you know, honestly, and can be, can be super helpful. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, I see them wrestling with this question of why didn't, you know, that's a big thing, you know, people say, well, the Marxists, but they're always quite critical of Marx, you know, right. as well. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah. you know, why didn't Marx's revolution occur? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this sense that they say, well, Marx was sort of actually wrong about religion being the opiate, you know, the peoples that's mm -hmm. actually this cultural fair, you know, this like kind of pop culture in some sense or entertainment culture is the actual opiate, you know, thing that yeah. is um, deadening our ability to respond. And I think there's some real explanatory power there. Again, I don't want to oversell it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course. But I yeah. think that it's been helpful both for me understanding as well as to communicate to some, to my students um, of the way that culture and the culture that they enjoy is not just about me finding it meaningful or not finding it meaningful, but it functions as part of a, an attention economy, you know, yeah. um, that is trying to colonize my imagination and, yeah. and fill all my empty, empty time and space, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's so interesting to me because, you know, I grew up, I'm, I'm 36, so I'm a child, mo mo primarily in the nineties. And uh, I just remember so many um, efforts by kind of the mass evangelical culture to to critique certain, I like, I remember, I, I honestly don't remember the specifics, but I remember there being concerns about craft and like being called to boycott craft mac and cheese. Oh, craft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I should the have specified K-R-A-F-T. Yeah, craft. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not craft, the, uh, you know, the concept. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the company, the corporation. Yeah. I remember being, being, getting letters. I don't know if you remember this, like getting letters to like boycott craft because of certain, I think certain ways they'd invested in certain politics remember getting calls to boycott Disney. Um, I remember getting, of course, tons and tons and tons of messages about how, how certain secular media would be shaping our imaginations in, in negative ways. And, and just it, to me, as I look back on those experiences, I think these are not that different in category from critical theory, mm. kind of as, as an attempt to diagnose how we're being shaped negatively, you know, by forces at work in culture and how we should be aware i just i think they were pretty poor misguided attempts but they were attempts and so it's just interesting to me that we have a lot of these same impulses it's just that um uh certain ones get branded in a certain way that we need to not not interact with and anyways that's just coming to mind as you're talking no, that's about interesting it. And, and i think that that's right it also strikes me that a lot of times those boycotts were organized around the content of belief that the company represented or maybe the yeah. ceo of the company said something publicly that that called for a boycott and it seems to me like the the key difference there is with critical theory 
the content is almost irrelevant. It's the form and the structure of that's good. You know, engagement that is it's the it's the fact that we watch Netflix constantly yes. more than what yep. we're watching on Netflix. You know, it could that's be good. pure flicks, you know, um, and <laughs> yeah. it's still going to be deformative to us because of the sheer ubiquity of entertainment that's washing over us to keep us from actual engagement. So mm-hmm. I think that that's the, the key difference there is that there is kind of a critique of the of the powers, but the critique of the powers is not just because of the content, but it's also because that's of the, good. the structure. You know? That might be why you're putting language to why I felt it was so shallow, actually, because it was yeah. only looking at content. That's really helpful. Um, all right. Well, we won't talk about critical theory. No, the that's time. great. That's I, I will. T- I, I will. One more comment. Sorry, I, I said we would move on, but one more comment comes to mind is it's also been fascinating to see. It feels as though in some ways the second generation of the Frankfurt School and what like almost turned back to religious um religious and spiritual kind of tools and language so people like terry eagleton and jürgen habermas like habermas they're sure. yeah, eagleton, yeah. yeah i mean they're i think i think i might be wrong i think eagleton may have even converted to catholicism by the end of his oh, life but mm. um anyways that's just that's a fascinating turn to me um and we could probably you know go down a, a rabbit trail with that but it seems that there was some grasping at more more transcendent um yeah. ideas that they, and, they felt like they needed and i think part of that is because critical theory excels at deconstructing and, and exposing yeah. and taking part it doesn't excel at building that's good building yep. something new and yep. so there was a need for some sort of turn to something you know mm-hmm. to to organize our shared life that's um, good so i think that that i mean and that's the reason and honestly why i have the next chapter is ethics because i wanted to distinguish between coercive power and the creative power that's necessary to build flourishing communities mm. um, so actually a friend of mine told me, so he read my power chapter and he said, okay, that's good, but this is only half the story. Um, you, you also need to talk about constructively, you know, the use of the use of power and ethics is not just about diagnosing mm. everything that's wrong, but also about building. Um, oh, wow. So is that where the ethics chapter then came that's from? Why, yeah, there wasn't originally going to be an ethics chapter. It was, uh, wow. it was actually the fault or the... <laughs> My friend who, who said, you need to write this, this another chapter. So, oh, wow. Well, the ethics chapter fits, fits really well into the fivefold, I think, the five lenses you're posing. Yeah. How did I miss it before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure there's a bunch of other lenses that I, sure. you know, I, I missed too. That's funny. Um, well, I, you, you said the power chapter was the, in some ways, the hardest. Um, what, if, if one comes to mind, what comes to mind is the easiest or what just kind of, poured out of you so to speak what yeah the what aesthetics was chapter do? which is chapter mm. five is probably my favorite thing that i've mm. written for publication oh wow uh it, it you know i think in some ways the the religion chapter and the aesthetics chapter is where i feel most comfortable uh that's sort of what i do uh, in theology mm-hmm. and culture and so yeah you know aesthetics the imagination you know um I just, I loved writing that chapter. Um, cool. I love kind of even getting at the elusive nature of what aesthetics even is um, mm-hmm. and how it seems so superficial. And yet in some ways I can make an argument it's the most important because it's our way into almost all of the other dimensions is a sort of aesthetic emotive engagement with yeah. with the world. And then, um, yeah, just, I think desire and delight as the things that need to be oriented in our engagement of culture and, and I got to talk about eschatology, you know, um, I think that that's the reason why I sort of liked um, that chapter on aesthetics. Yeah, well, it is a fantastic chapter. I think I, I said even in my email, you think it might be right up there with the power chapter in terms yeah. of ones that stuck with me the most. And I think when, um, when we think, so I'm an elder millennial, I guess, is my, I don't know, my, my generational category. Uh, a geriatric millennial. A geriatric, the, yeah, right. Is that the term. <laughs> yeah, I think I've slipped right in. Right in. Uh, um, when I think about people my age and younger, and especially Gen Z or whatever they ultimately end up being being called, um, aesthetics it was massively important. I see that as being so important too. I, power, power. There's a lot of language and talk about power and discourse mm-hmm. about power, but when I see what's actually like affecting people what people care about certainly people's entry points into faith especially i just think aesthetics is um 
I don't know if there's something generationally happening or what's happening culturally that's creating that, but I see that. Um, I feel that. I'm curious if you see the same thing or yeah, uh, what I, aesthetics I plays for you. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, and I think that in general, and again, this is the argument in my first book in some ways, yeah. is that um, we may judge what is beautiful by what is good and what is good by what is true, but that's not the order we experience the transcendentals. We usually enter into truth through goodness and goodness through beauty, you know? So um, mm -hmm. we start by saying like, is it beautiful? Or do I, so I always say like, do I even want this to be true? Like, would, yeah. would this be like generative and capacious for a life if this is true? Um, which is part of that questions of the aesthetic dimension is what are the possibilities that are inherent in um, this cultural artifact or whatever it is. And I think that part of that, the way that we negotiate our sense of self has to do with space, um, wanting to feel like we have space to explore, space to, uh, sec to be secure. Um, and if we feel like we're cramped and the world is narrow and there are not very many possibilities, um, we naturally kind of try to break out of that, I think. Mm. And, um, and so I think that starting with the aesthetic starts where people are. Um, and yeah, we were talking about Charles Taylor a bit ago, and um, I think he really makes this argument too, that we live in the age of authenticity. And you can either deny that and try to turn back the clock in some way, or you can just say, no, the struggle is actually over thicker and thinner versions of authenticity, Yep. which requires us to, to start and stay in the aesthetic dimension yeah. uh, in which authenticity is negotiated. Um, and so I think that, yeah, that, that sense of helping students, at least my students or young people see that um, this is beautiful, you know, and yeah. this is generative and this opens up possibilities um, that even go beyond the horizon of the human, you know, in terms of the possibility of life after death or that um, the things that we do and fail could in some ways be taken up um, mm. by God and, and, and woven into a larger tapestry of, of meaning and justice. So I That's think good. that that sense of the possibility that is inherent in the aesthetic dimension is, is where people are. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think we can dis disconnect aesthetics from ethics and uh, from truth, but I think that it makes sense to start there and to um, yeah. organize our cultural engagement in terms of aesthetics. Yeah, that's good. I wasn't planning to ask you this, but it comes to mind as we're talking about aesthetics. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot, theory, concepts, abstract. Um, I would love to just hear you talk about what, what are you finding beautiful currently? Like, are there aspects of culture, pop culture? I don't know. Um, hmm. What do you think communicates beauty or, or, or is, is containing beauty well right now in our culture? It could be Christian or not. Does anything come to mind? Yeah, I'd have to think about that for a second. Sure. I'll tell you one one that came to mind as I was yeah. thinking. Um, maybe that'll help. Uh, are you familiar with Francis Bufford, the writer? Yeah. Um, I just I actually referenced him in my previous interview, so I don't know, maybe I got him on the brain. But uh, his book, new new novel, Light Perpetual, um, just left me completely gobsmacked. Um, I found and I read it before I knew he's a Christian. I didn't. Hmm. wasn't aware of his previous writings on faith, but it hmm. came out, Light Perpetual came out, I believe it came out in 21 last year, I think. And um, have you heard of it? Are you familiar with it? Uh, no, I mean, I've, I've read his unapologetic yeah. uh, book, but I haven't read his novel. No. Which I also love. Um, but, well, I would recommend it. Um, the concept is it's based on a real historical event of a bombing that happened in London at a department store, I believe, during World War II that actually, actually did kill... Um, killed a lot of people including five kids mm. so it's a tragic historical event but he reimagines that the bomb does not land there and those five kids live and then he traces each of their lives out too and it ends up it, it's it's a robust celebration of the possibilities contained in life you know is really what mm. um what it is and he's such a beautiful writer and i, and I just it, it really um spoke at that aesthetic dimension directly to me possibly because of where I was when I read it I had just maybe we had just had our second child so <laughs> I was thinking along those lines already and primed to receive it but 
it was so utterly gorgeous. And, and then I found out he's a Christian and of course has all these like spiritual uh, traditions he's pulling on. So anyways, that's one example that comes to mind that resonates a lot with, I think what you're doing with the aesthetics chapter. So, yeah, no, that's good. I mean, honestly, the first thing you, you said, the first thing I thought when you said that was not really culture, but just nature, you know, so it's ah. fall, you know, autumn mm-hmm. and uh, the, watching the leaves change and taking my dog for a walk in the midst of that. I mean, I'm yeah. finding an incredible, we just got a, a puppy and um, that has slowed our life down in all sorts of ways, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and trip made things. Yeah. Made trip very trivial things very important like did the dog go to the bathroom today you know and so mm. I, I think that there's something about that experience of caring for a living thing you know that um, yeah that, yeah i don't know in, in some ways has given me a sense of groundedness you know like when the book came out you feel really insecure about your work you know and people yeah. having it now and will people even read it am i just shouting into a hurricane yeah and yet i found that my whatever my sense of the, the wondering about myself was almost drowned out by worrying about my dog you know what i mean uh, and it was just almost the sense of it, it directed my attention away from myself and hmm. i appreciate things that do that that hmm. um that cat catch me up in another story or catch me up in other concerns so that it kind of quiets my ego down a bit um, and so I was trying to think of what sorts of things uh, have done that in terms of culture. And I'll tell you, the best book I read this year um, was Suzanne Clark's Piranesi. Oh. Um, have you read that one? No. So she wrote the book know Jonathan that. Strange and Mr. Norell, yeah. which is this like thousand page, um, this thousand page footnoted fantasy novel, <laughs> you yeah. know, and uh, written as almost like a historical, you know, epic or something like that anyway so she's written this new she wrote this new book last i think last year piranesi about this man who finds himself in this cavernous house um with ocean with an ocean inside it and uh Hmm. and it's really really fascinating like it's first of all just the way it's written it kind of catches you up in this sort of like like i've wondered what would it have been like to use kind of charles taylor's language to live in kind of that enchanted enchanted world you know yeah. what i mean where you have a yeah. particularly particular relationship with um everything around you um that is more alive and vital mm. and i think that this book kind of captures that um at least for the first hundred pages before it becomes a different sort of book um but yeah that's mm. that's the first thing i thought of that it's yeah. it's very rare i feel like um I, you know, I read quite a few books, you know, for my, for my work. And I try to read a third of the books I read have, have them be novels. And, Mm. and yet I feel like the experience of being entranced by a book is pretty rare. Um, And that's a book that entranced me. Wow. Okay. So so I would say that, um, yeah, works like that, that um, can ground, can ground the ego by catching you up in a, a more interesting story than your own story. Um, mm. I, I think that in, in a very real sense, Christians need to be doing that sort of work, right? <laughs> yeah. They need to be telling stories and writing stories that don't have explicitly always, you know, like the, you know, the, the joke about, you know, Jesus, a certain number of, you know, JPMs. Jesus or, yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah, but they're actually, taking our interest away from ourselves and catching us up into something bigger mm. and better and more beautiful. And I think mm. in a lot of ways that uh, is, is an act of culture care, um, setting us free from that obsession with ourselves. And so, I mean, I, I could probably talk about other like the music of Sigur Rós or something like that, mm. but, uh, but I mean, I think that those are the sorts of things that I find myself drawn to and gravitated towards um, mm. because of the way that it, um, yeah, it makes you feel small without being diminished in some sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Something I was talking about, I mentioned, I did an interview with Andy Root, um, and something you just said resonates a lot with his work and what something we talked about, which was this idea of, well, mysticism, I think, Christian mysticism connects with a lot of the stuff we're talking about, enchantment, transcendent experiences, yep. um, aesthetics. But what you just said reminded me of the notion of 
getting a glimpse of the transcendent, a glimpse of the divine, but without utterly losing yourself. So something bigger than yourself that includes yourself, you know, Um, that seems to be very powerful and utterly out of our control. (laughs) Um, I guess it depends on your theological tradition, but um, that seems to be kind of what you're, what you're talking about actually, as you articulate some of that. And, and I think to connect to what I said earlier, I think that that is something that, for the generations who've grown up thoroughly in the disenchanted world that Taylor talks about, like those moments of enchantment are really powerful um, yeah. and real, where they're very real for oh. people. Um, yeah, I also thought of, um, I know it's sort of controversial, but Rings of Power, I, I mm. quite enjoyed um, that that series. I mean, I love Tolkien in general, yeah. um, but especially the vis- visually and, and Tolkien is full of moments of eucatastrophe. Of, oh, yeah thing that just kind of makes your heart beat a little bit faster and yeah watching the show had me going back to the books to read my favorite scenes of uh Mm. or listen to the audiobook you know of my favorite scenes of of you catastrophe oh it's so good oh man you can't bring up tolkien right at the last minutes that's my Lord of the Rings is my favorite book. If I'm pressed, I have to. Oh, great! That's, that's yeah. the one. I, <laughs> Let's yeah. just talk and, about that then. Yeah, we should have we scheduled another like interview. Rings just... of Power or is that is that? So uh... here's the embarrassing thing: I have not watched a single episode okay. of it of it yet. I was waiting for the whole thing to come out, and then I was like, well, "I'm going to reread the Silmarillion to get myself yeah. like ready for it." And so now I'm I got to finish the Silmarillion before I start it. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, yeah we got it too. But while I was watching it, yeah. okay, maybe I can start it then. Um, but we, I've also heard good things. Uh, I know there's some controversy around it, but maybe we can do an interview number two just about Tolkien. Yeah, no, just I, about I, could, Tolkien, no. <laughs> I could talk about that forever, but I would love, what's your, what's like, you said your favorite scenes of you catastrophe. What's, what's a scene from, from Tolkien that comes to mind? Thus came Aragorn, Aragorn, son of Arathorn. You know, that, yeah, that yeah. scene of showing mm-hmm. up with the, on the Corsair ships and yeah. Eomer throwing, you know, throwing his, taking his sword to shake against him, and then just yeah. kind of being surprised by the the standard with the, uh, oh man, I'm like my heart is kind of yep, like, yep. Even talking about, it. I love. I mean, I don't think I have ever read that scene without tears. Um, yeah, because it's such a, a beautiful scene of yep. of catastrophe. Yeah. Absolutely. I for me, one of the ones that always gets me is Faramir's speech when he. Re- rejects the ring when he mm. steps wow. in i i see it as a almost a recapitulation like a first adam second adam kind of move yeah. like he given his shame from from denethor and carrying the 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 shame of the family you know and knowing what is what boromir did and then stepping yeah. into that moment and rejecting the ring oh yeah that's, yeah, cool. that's the part that that gets me in my bones yeah um and then the speech he gives is just so absolutely beautiful but so yeah. there we go. There's some there's some aesthetic moments that good, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe people watching this are into Tolkien. They'll they'll resonate. Otherwise, they will have stopped watching by this point. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll put a chapter mark here. This is where we talk about Tolkien. You can skip yeah. it. Um, well, I will watch Rings of Power. I'll do that on on your recommendation. It's good to know. Um, I know you're running out of time, so let's just. I just want to end with. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on anything you're working on currently, or anything you're just purely enjoying. Um, projects or reading or anything but sure. yeah well, i mean i have a stack of books on my desk that i'm supposed to be writing reviews of or kind mm. of getting ready for podcast um podcast interviews so that's something i'm working on um obviously i'm doing a, a good amount of speaking related to this book but i've started a new research project or a new writing project uh, which is pretty early right now um that has to do again with my fascination with the imagination but uh in relationship to prayer and uh so if we, I guess here's sort of the way I'm thinking about it at the moment. Um, hmm. So we have this idea of the diseased imagination. So uh, Willie James Jennings. I was going to say that's Willie Jennings, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talks about the diseased Fantastic book. imagination. Um, and if you think about the imagination as being diseased, it almost, again, the way that metaphors change the way that you think about engaging them. I think I've always thought about training the imagination and wanted wanting to disciple the imagination. And, and my model of discipleship has almost always had to do something with training in, in imaginative virtue. But if you think of the imagination as diseased, can you disciple a diseased imagination? Oh, wow. Does the training not also include healing? And so mm. then what does healing look like? And what does healing require? 
And then I sort of started to think, okay, well, the practice in which the imagination might be healed um, could be could be prayer, you know, of, of a certain mm. variety. And so what what does prayer do to the imagination or what does the imagination do to prayer? Um, there are some forms of prayer that are pretty imaginative, imaginatively intensive. So if you think of Ignatian modes of composition of scene where you imagine yourself in a gospel passage, you know, um, and your imagination is meant to supply all the details, not just the sights, but the sounds and the smells um, in order to kind of open yourself up to some sort of real emotional encounter with, with God. And then you also have forms of prayer that are that require an incredible amount of imaginative exercise, but in the other direction where I'm resisting images, I'm resisting mm. in some cases thoughts, you know, so you have kind of a cataphatic and a, then kind of an apophatic mode of, of prayer, you know, of kind of listening or waiting. And I just sort of wondering like what, how did these various modes of prayer shape the imagination and how might they also heal the imagination um, so that it can be rightly oriented towards wow god and neighbor and the world so anyway it's all great right now because it's all just kind of brainstorming but yeah that's <laughs> fascinating have to sit down and write uh finish a book a book proposal which is overdue already mm. for it and um and that that'll hopefully be my next my next book but i've agreed to cool. speak in chapel here at dort where i teach six times during lent and those six chapel talks will form the basis of 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 that book oh fantastic um, yeah so that's what i'm starting to work on oh that's moment. great no i i'm i'm very intrigued um i used to do college ministry i did eight years of college parachurch ministry through university yeah. and um some of the more memorable and i would say powerful prayer group prayer exercises were imaginative were ignatian in in, in kind of form mm. um that are coming to mind as you're articulating that. So, but the, but the notion of healing, uh, that's a powerful, that's a powerful idea. Um, so I'm excited to see what you do with it. Um, yeah, it'd be great. Well, uh, let's wrap here. This is a good note to end on. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah. yeah really, no, really appreciate pleasure. it. Really Thanks for your work. The conversation. Me too.